Hey, it's Mazzy here. <laughs> I'm going to show you 101 records because this was a request, a whacked out vinyl tag from Dan. Dan has a channel called Dots and Loops, and Dan was one of the two first vinyl community uh, creators I met in person. Uh, Dan's from Canada. He was in Seattle five, six years ago, whatever it was. No, four or five years ago. Anyway, uh, and I met the Omaha uh, introvert the exact same day, uh, Hannah, at the Seattle Record Show. Anyway, he did his own version. It's sort of a contest, but 101 questions. You can answer 10, 20, 30, or all of them. I'm going to go very fast. Uh, if I win, I want to donate this to someone who will appreciate it more. It's an original American Black Sabbath record. Of course, I should keep it. Let me listen to it first, at least. Anyway, I'm going to just go through these really fast 101 questions. Uh, Todd Rundgren involvement, uh, the first New York Dolls record he produced. A record with fewer than five letters in the title. Goo, goo, gajoob. No, it's just goo, Sonic Youth. A record from high school you still own. Well, I mean, 500 of these are from high school that I still own. This one, proof because only one year, 1971, for whatever reason, I, I guess I took these to uh, friends' houses and it's a Maslow branded record. And no, that doesn't ruin your records, dropping them flat on a carpeted floor. I take care of them really well. A record you were supposed to like, but didn't. This is an easy one, and I don't even have the album. I only have the CD because it came in a bigger box. But I did have it. Oh, my God, this is terrible. And um, Dylan, Bob Dylan, love Bob Dylan. Love the Grateful Dead. Dylan and the Dead Alive. What a piece of crap live piece of shit this record is. I'm supposed to, but I don't because they're two uh, favorite bands of mine. Third, three degrees of separation. So basically, like Kevin Bacon style, Bruce Springsteen, E Street, Shuffle, Southside, Johnny and Asbury Jukes, you know, Friends of Bruce, New Jersey, Asbury Park, uh, cover some of his songs, Little Stevie, and uh, Phil Spector's Greatest Hits because of Ronnie Spector, who's on this, this album, too. Six Degrees of Separation. First soundtrack you ever got. Well, my parents got uh, things like My Fair Lady, West Side Story, but this is the first one that I got, Hard Day's Night, 1964, original mono, my original mono from 1964 of A Hard Day's Night. A good $5 record, a good $5 record everyone should own. Now, this specific one is a white label promo, but Judy Collins' greatest hits, what an angelic voice, and you need it at least, for the very least, for the opening song, Someday Soon, the great song by the late Ian Tyson, who we just lost, a wonderful Canadian songwriter from Ian and Sylvia, uh, produced, uh, helped with uh, Judy Collins by Stephen Still, suggesting she cover that song. A definitive country folk song, Someday Soon, going with me, going with them someday, someday soon. A record that defined you 25 years ago, uh, 1998? My son was eight years old. I was raising my son, and I was got really into Calexico. This came out that year, The Black Light. Uh, just spaghetti western, cinematic, beautiful, like, border songs and music, and just, I love Calexico. A record that rhymes with orange. Well, orange is the new black, so black. I know that's, like, bending the rules here. Now, this is not a good album except one amazing track. And I don't know if Black ever made it. From Liverpool, I was all over this CD. I, I, every once in a while I find this record. Um, it's okay, but the song, Wonderful Life, is a great 80s masterpiece. I'm thinking 87, 88, this came out. But listen to Wonderful Life by Black. It's just, it's a great song. The rest of the album, so-so. From Liverpool, I don't know what he did after this, but um, kind of a cool record. But, you know, I got to listen to it again, revisit it. Okay, a hard-to-find record from popular popular artists, one of my top three artists, The Kinks. Uh, this import is noted as the Black Album. It's a comp. It did come in the mono box, a version of it, but the original UK is hard to get. Uh, most common record in your collection. Well, there's so many. I mean, everyone's going to show, I bet you, Herb Alpert and stuff. But I would say, you know, Abbey Road is, they keep pressing and they keep putting it out. It's a fantastic record, but it's very common. You can get, I mean, maybe not this specific original 
stereo well it was only in stereo a uk copy but you can find a copy of that anytime you want and you should if you don't have abbey road you should two of the furthest farthest away records not in common in your collection so on this side we have enya's debut and the other side we got oh oh it fell out of the sleeve <laughs> honest i had it in the sleeve i didn't want to show the naughty bits but uh, two virgins john and yoko so john and yoko and enya you don't really hear them as like who would be the opening act for who <laughs> on that double bill okay uh, a record that makes you want to puke now not that this is a horrible record. I have both uh, Screaming Lord Such records, or Lord Such and Heavy Friends, I should say. He was an actual lord that got all these uh, great guitarists and British musicians to make these two albums. And this one has Jimmy Page, John Bonham, Jeff Beck, Noel Redding, and Nick Nicky Hopkins. It's not a horrible record. He sings, and but this is the reason I don't play records when I'm sick. I remember, I don't know when it was, when I was in college, maybe? Uh, in the 70s, I was really sick, fluish, and I put this record on, and to this day, whenever I listen to it, I feel kind of nauseous. I don't know if it's the music or that sense memory of being sick and playing it way back 40-some years ago, 50, almost 50 years ago. Okay, a record with a horrible pressing. Well, bootlegs are notorious horrible pressings. This is uh, not the very first Get Back. I, I lettered it in and I wrote the songs. Of course, the Glenn Johns mix and one of the first bootlegs along with Great White Wonder Dylan. This isn't the very first one, but this is a pressing. These are notoriously not great, but that's not the point of these records. And this is how I got Get Back uh, before it came out in 1970, 71, I think, uh, on that one. A very nice sounding record. Well, I think pretty much any version you can get, early version of this is an amazing record. Produced by Simon Garfunkel and Roy Halley. Roy Haley, who Halley, who also engineered it. What a great sounding record. And my favorite, fa uh, my favorite Simon Garfunkel record. Mono's rare, but the stereo is better anyway. So anytime, if you don't have this record, uh, this is a perfect uh, folk rock record. 1968 Simon Garfunkel with this great, great photograph by Richard Avedon. Okay, a the best inner sleeve. Well, I'm going old school to something that was very different at the time. And this is, of course, Sgt. Pepper. Inner sleeves weren't like this. You know, they had promos for the record. Record companies, Capitol Records had their promos. Columbia Records. Every record had their, you know, other things they release. And occasionally get a plain sleeve. But... This, designed by The Fool for The Beatles, Peter Blake did the cover. Uh, Michael Cooper photographed Peter Blake's assemblage, his uh, amazing creation. We all know that. But this inner sleeve, when it came out, was so cool. Of, of course, we know the Rolling Stones copy The Beatles later that year. A cover you can't stand, but you love the record. I just showed this on another video. Horrible photograph cover by Andy Leibowitz. And I like her photography. I just don't like this. But the good thing is, Mia Culpa, when uh, Silk Degrees, the subsequent album, became a huge hit, they changed the cover to this. So they made up for it. A record that is too long but has some good songs. Still, it's a fantastic record. And I like listening to the whole thing. But Odessa uh, kind of was a bomb uh, when it came out. But I love the psychedelic -y pop, uh, Baroque, psych, pop, offerings of the Bee Gees, and Odessa's a great record. Du double record set, elongated, kind of operatic in a way, telling a story, but it's too long, would have been a good, I mean, I like it now. Uh, there's some amazing songs on it, like, um, what's the one that reminds me of the band? Uh, Marley Per Drive always reminds me of the band. Listen to that and think of the band. So the Bee Gees, Odessa. Okay, a record that makes you cry. To me, I've showed this many times. To me, this is probably the most angelic, beautifully angelic record in my collection. It doesn't make me cry all the time, but it's just it's just a, a lovely piece of music from beginning to end. I can't listen to one track on this album. This is the debut solo album, Angel Claire, recorded in San Francisco by Art Garfunkel, part of it at uh, Columbia Studios and Folsom Street, Grace Cathedral. And this is also produced by Garfunkel and Roy Halley too, so it sounds great. Garcia's on it, Jerry Garcia. Uh, uh, just the San Francisco people, and what a, it just, it's like going to church, Jewish church, <laughs> that makes, yeah, we, we have ours, we have our temples, it's just, 
it's, it's like the choirs are singing and opening it up. And it, it does, it brings, it make it chokes me up every time. Your workout record, <laughs> as if I work out, uh, electronic sound, George Harrison, with a little help of uh, Bernie Krause, Moog synthesizer experimentation. I own this record because someone said I should, and that is, uh, I haven't listened to it yet, Michael Poetry on Plastic, it, during our Portland visit, made me buy it. Punk, Swedish, late 90s. A record that sounds totally different than you thought it would. Now, depending on how you go with Sun Ra, you can, you can get in trouble or just go with it or be outraged or just enjoy it. This is a gorgeous record. One of my favorite records, reissues of last year. I love this record. Great sound, great music. Really love it. So it was a, it was a surprise to me. An overrated record. Well, some would say every Eagles is overrated, but I kind of like the Eagles. I like Hotel California, I like their first few albums. I think this is the overrated one. So I needed, I wanted to put the Eagles in here just to kind of stick it to uh, Don Henley and Glenn Fry, rest in peace. Uh, you know, there's some good tracks on there. Long run, I kind of like, but after a while, it's like eh, overrated. An underrated record. This is one that is very controversial in the Leonard Cohen catalog, and it is a mess. It's a total, utterly mess. And Leonard Cohen, after when it came out, actually said it's a mess. He had a, him and uh, Phil Spector, it's basically the Phil Spector sound with the Leonard Cohen poetry, very sexual, very in your face. But I quite like this record. So um, it is a interesting record to me. A record you have no idea why you own it because you've never listened to it. Well. I actually know why I own it. I don't, never listen to this record, but I'm into sort of uh, interesting kind of loungy bachelor pad, that kind of uh, exotica cover art. I haven't listened to this record, but I think it's cool and Zodiac and I'm a Virgo, by the way. A record that makes you levitate. Now, you can take this in so many ways, but in a way, to me, this has become a spiritual record because I bought this the Friday before, I guess, the Sunday, Monday, Bowie came out. The day it was released, I picked it up locally. And then I woke up uh, Monday morning, the following Monday, and I listened to it like two or three times that weekend. It's a beautiful, dark record. And of course, it's his uh, David Bowie swan song, and you know he knew he was dying. So in a way, this levitates. It's very spiritual. I'm not a religious person, but I have a spiritual side to me, definitely. A record that looks cool, that makes you feel cool. I don't know about that. I think, not about feeling, but this kind of looks cool to me. People hate clowns. People are freaked out about clowns, but I think this is a cool record. And I think, t in so many ways, Charles Mingus, and it's got this great long piece, narrated, improvised by Gene Shepard, uh, the clown, and it's just a cool story about this clown. And I, I, I love this record. So there you go. Uh, an instructional record, well, you see where this is going. Dave Brubeck goes to college. A record that healed, depending on your Zen meditation mode. We used to sell this record in the store all the time in Northern California in the 70s. Tony Scott, music for Zen meditation, sort of clarinet, uh, jazzy, but almost like the Paul Horn inside. I could have picked that one too. This is just a spiritual, beautiful uh, record, and it's a cheap record. Namaste, okay? And um, a record with bad graphic design. This is friggin' lazy. Uh, I don't even love the sound of this record um, that much. I know Don West produced it, who's a good producer, and Stones, and their last official studio record of blues cuts and, you know, bluesy thing. I think it's like, slap your logo on the cover, give it a tint. Really lazy, really, really weak. A record that changed over time for me, my first jazz album. Pitches Brew, hated it in 1970 when I bought it, loved it in 1973 when I heard it again. Kurt Cobain ruined it, all 80s fun. Well, I don't know about that, but New Order, it's the only New Order album I really like. The first UK press, of this one with the great uh, Peter Seville designed cover, a record made me high. Paul Kantner, Jefferson Starship, not the band Jefferson Starship, a project of future of space, escaping Earth. Lots of great people on it. I love this friggin' record. The Airplane, The Dead, all these people on it. A surprising dance record. Well, I'm going in a different direction here. 
The greatest rock and roll record the Beatles ever made was In America Only, the Beatles' second album, a great rock and roll hits record. Dave Marsh did a whole book, the critic, the writer, on this being the best rock and roll record the Beatles ever made. And you can dance to it in old 60s style, maybe, but you can still dance to it. A maddening record, literally. Wild Man Fisher, if you don't know, <laughs> look it up. Scary record, unintentional or not. Now, I don't want to say it's scary, but, you know, there's a whole different thing when, you know, Tom Waits was evolving. I love this record, Rain Dogs, but it's kind of, it's kind of like creepy at first. But uh, then you see the beauty in it as you get down to all the great layers. I mean, I don't think he's made a bad album, uh, but some people say, I like his earlier melodic stuff instead of, you know, weird instrumental stuff. A short record, uh, literally... Uh, Instant Karma, John Lennon backed with Who Has Seen the Wind. He wanted it, he'd recorded this so fast, they pressed it so fast, it was basically, I think, out and in the stores almost within a week. That's why Instant Karma's gonna get you. It's gonna knock you off your feet. Mixed Race record, I'm staying with that because the beauty of this record, it's um, obviously Caucasian and Japanese artist. And the reason I picked this, obviously, I'm a big fan of uh, John Lennon and the Beatles and Yoko Ono. And I just think the beauty of this uh, alternating songs, it's really a, a, a communion of music. And, um, you know, originally I liked a lot of the Yoko stuff originally first, because I think it was more of the time of, of 1980 when this came out. Of course, the tragedy, uh, you know, a month or two after this came out, just made this a whole different feel to this record. But mixed race record, a love record and a beautiful record. Double Fantasy, John and Yoko. Your most eclectic album, I'd say The Caretaker. There's a series of The Caretaker records. English composer, uh, performance, uh, uh, engineer, musician. But he works with these in, in this series of records, Caretaker, kind of influenced by uh, Stanley Kubrick's um, The Shining with The Caretaker, The Hall Haunted Room. He takes these 1930s ballroom records, 78s, slows them down, uh, multiplies them on uh, uh, digitally over over layers and slows it way down and it's just kind of beautifully creepy uh, the caretaker series record with no guitar steve reich different trains with the chronos quartet uh, obviously uh, somewhat you know based on the holocaust post holocaust a beautiful piece of the modernist uh, composer 20th century composer steve reich with the great uh, chronos quartet <laughs> those are guitars for me i didn't even think of that so may, anyway you, you get the picture maybe there are guitars on that maybe i'm totally wrong your record with the most organ well i got a lot i mean i could pick you know box and saint sans organ uh pieces but i'm going with jimmy smith because i have a lot of jimmy smith the great jazz organist could have gone with shirley scott dr lonnie liston smith uh so many and the cat this is on uh, verve I believe, yeah, for the cat. The record with the best 80s rock ballad. I mean, I'm not a big, uh, big of the power ballad stuff, but I mean, come on, one of the best recorded records. And I'm going to pick the song, You Turn Me On, How Romantic is Brian Ferry and this audiophile masterpiece. And it is a great record, you know, overplayed in record in stereo stores, but still it's a great record and a great, eight, like 1982, I think that came out. Okay, Best Blind Buy. When this came out on CD, I bought it on Luca Bop uh, because of the uh, little hype sticker, I think. It was uh, Jim White, kind of an, uh, like a an weird side of Americana, alternate country, really cool record. Luca Bop is uh, David Burns' label. Uh, Wrong Eyed Jesus, love this record by Jim White. Turtles, a turtle, turtle, obvious, obvious there. A record you still want to like, but not sure why. I love Steppenwolf and Monster. A lot of people love this record. Now, I keep trying. I know the long piece Monster, very political. And I love that about it. And I like it, but I don't love it. So there we go. That's the answer to that question. Uh, the best guilty pleasure ever. I don't know why this is even a guilty pleasure. And people seem to like it, including myself. I'm guilty of this, but I love everything in you. All in you all the time and of course the best thing to do if you're just dipping your toes get this double collection of her best beautiful music just just wonderful okay hidden funk not even hidden i mean this i mean 
you're not hidden here. This is basically um, the clones of Dr. Funkenstein. I mean, come on, man. Tear the roof off the fucking sucker, right? Jazz, no one knows that slays. I, you know, I'm sure a lot of people know this record, but um, this is the champ. I mean, Dizzy Gillespie, the great, one of the greatest jazz musicians ever. Love him. Uh, that bebop sound of him with Dizzy Gillespie, Milk Jackson, Bill Graham, Joe Carroll. Barry White saved my life. The 90s. The best record that came out in the 1990s, Automatic for the People. No question, no argument. The best record of the 90s. A record in concert memorabilia. Okay. The concert for George that I attended. I love that. Concert for George. Here's my uh, ticket to the Royal Albert Hall. Proving to you naysayers that I would. And I didn't buy this on eBay. I went to the ticket, and you, they gave me the whole ticket. They didn't, they ripped a portion of it off. And, of course, the Genesis book I won't go through, and that's memorabilia. I got a huge poster of the show, et cetera, et cetera. A record that flopped. Now, people, this record technically didn't flop, but I got a story. I'll be quick. A passion play. Came out after Jethro Tull's um, Thick as a Brick. I worked in a record store. I had a brown Pinto. I had to pick the allotment for our small-ish store in San Francisco. I went down and, and our allotment for our small store in, within a chain of California record stores, 600 copies for one little store. My Pinto was like this. <laughs> I was low riding all the way home from San Mateo to San Francisco, picking this up from the distributor. And, uh, I think after the month or whatever it was when we returned the record, we returned probably 550 of this record out of those 600 records. Now, I know it did pretty well. I think this is a record that I should have liked that I don't. I still have several of all the posters. I think I have two or three of, uh, of these things promoting it there. So uh, there you go. And I, you know, every like 10 years, I pull it out trying to like it. I think this is a flop. I think this is a dog. Should have included that in a bunch of other questions there. An independent record. This is one of the very first thousand independent uh, copies of The Residents, their first album, Meet the Residents. Uh, I actually got it because we had it on consignment in our store in San Francisco. We had probably 10 copies out of the thousand. And this is first pressing, 1974,000 copies, of course, because of the cover, Avant Garde Artsy Collective in San Francisco. I think they're more interesting live and performing than listening to the record. But you're in the mood, it's kind of a cool. Um, adventurous, experimental uh, record. A soul classic, well, to me, there's no better soul singer, or the best soul singer. Well, isn't best a subjective thing, but um, I'm saying, I'm going with Sam Cooke at the Copa, recorded live in New York City. The great Sam Cooke, the voice of soul, the man who invented soul is what they call him. Uh, 50s record, of course, there's not much better. Oh, there's so many great 50s things, but for me, Buddy Holly and the Crickets, and look at those great guitars with that probably 1954 Strat there on the cover. Um, what a great, great record there, Buddy Holly and the Crickets. A glam record. You know, it's Crosses Over, produced by David Bowie, Mott the Hoople on Columbia, all the young dudes, the, the song that Bowie wrote, and Ian Hunter just kills it on this record worldwide album basically international influences and and that's radha krishna temple george harrison produced radha krishna temple they were living in london but you know part of the krishna the bhagavita uh i mean just i love this record i am missing you oh krishna where are you love it love it on apple records of course always the beetle connection whatever you say there's a beetle connection a played out record. Of course, Frampton comes alive. This is a generational question, but when I worked in record stores, this album, Fleetwood Max, Rumors, Eagles, Hotel California, you couldn't get away from them. I couldn't listen to these albums for th over 30 years. Well played out at the time. I haven't heard it in a while either. Come Fly With Me, Sinatra. There you go, Sinatra. Lost, British Invasion. You don't really hear anything these days about Billy J. Kramer and... Um, Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas. Of course, they really got famous because of Lennon-McCartney songs. I'll keep you satisfied from a window. John and Paul wrote them. 
part of the uh, stable of Brian Epstein artists. You don't really hear about him, unfortunately. But, you know, they had their moment, 64, maybe 65, maybe 66, out of here. Get Kinky Friedman, Kinky Friedman as Texas Jew Boys out of Texas, great country, Jewish rock and roll, country rock in a way. Uh, lady Rockers, I mean, there's no one else in my book, the, or the lady, the queen of rock and roll for me is Patti Smith, Easter, any Patti Smith record. A risk, a change in directions, a risk for an artist. When the Birds, 1968, did all country, Sweetheart of the Rodeo, this record bombed. Bomb, Lewin Brothers, country music. Graham Parsons comes in, Clarence White comes in uh, playing some guitar. Fantastic record became a huge influential record over the years but at the time it bombed it didn't work it was a total bomb <laughs> bomb a country bomb progressive symphonic pleasure now i didn't go with specific prog rock this is more art rock but when they left um uk when they switched basically to polygram and mercury uh, there's a long story there but the opening track on this which is One Night in Paris, this long and gated art suite. Not Prague, really, but I think it's beautiful. It's, it's symphonic pleasure telling a story. And of course, I'm Not in Love, their biggest hit ever, probably, yes, is on here. Uh, written the same year as Bohemian Rhapsody with those multi-layer of uh, overdubbed vocals. But they didn't have the front man like Freddie Mercury. Electronic Dreams. I just started college. Clockwork Orange. I saw this movie in 1972. Wow. I mean, the violence, the over the top. But electronic music by uh, Walter Carlos, now Wendy Carlos at the time. Of course, I've been turned on to uh, Walter Wendy because of Switched on Bach. But I love that um, Stanley Kubrick used her to do this whole soundtrack and with Beethoven and and uh, William Tell Overture uh, by Rossini, I think, right? But uh, what a great record. Love the Moog Synthesizer, uh, Bernie Krause also, probably I could have shown. Uh, the Beatles and Why. Well, this is going in a little different direction. The very first Plastic Ono Band, Yoko Ono Plastic Ono Band album. John Lennon is on here, who used to be in the Beatles, and Ringo Starr is on here. Of course, Yoko Ono and Klaus Vorman. But the first two tracks that take up entire side one is why and why not so the beatles and why that's half the beatles yoko ono why and why not rockabilly record of course the johnny burnett trio what a great trio what i mean johnny burnett johnny burnett rock and roll rockabilly need i say more heavy record heavy wax basically i mean i'm just talking about physicality uh, this is a Music Matters Jazz double 45, and this thing weighs a ton. I don't know if it's 180, probably 200 gram. Tomcat Lee Morgan, uh, Joe Harley Rom Rombox label, prior to Joe Harley doing the Tone Poet thing. Fantastic record, but this is a heavy, heavy record. This is an early, early pressing of that record. Blue Notes. Greatest splatter vinyl. I have so many, you know, we all do now because of the nature of things. But I think one of the interesting bands is doing great psychedelic cover stuff is uh, the Flaming Lips and their covers alone. I mean, look at that. Like, I love that kind of electric, psychedelic day glow cover. And this isn't one of the bright ones, but look at that. That is so, not really splatter, it's like dropping dark, moody eerie but really really a beautiful record and of course i love the band i like pretty much everything they do is interesting even if it doesn't always work a musty crusty moldy smelly record you won't get rid of i don't buy those records this is a cool question speak and spell so spoken word with music mixed in this is a rhino box some of these records i think were just reissued because the originals are really hard to get expensive but jack kerouac collection if you like bee poetry or you like on the road or jack kerouac but this is the one to get really i mean it's probably the most accessible out of these which has a great steve allen comedian and great jazz piano player playing while jack kerouac reads from uh, his uh poet poetry in his books bad badly produced record i would say this comes as close as uh, you can get to a badly produced record phil Spector, john lennon kind of finished it back and forth you know 
The idea, the concept of John Lennon doing oldies seems like a perfect thing. And I was so disappointed. Love the cover. Jürgen Bomer's a great photograph of the Beatles walking by and John Lennon in the doorway there. Uh, stop and start, Phil Spector, then John Lennon comes back to it. Except for Stand By Me, the production is, you know, again, I showed that Leonard Cohen earlier. It, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I think this goes in the direction. Novelty, yes. The horrible production. Phil Spector, when it works, it's great. When it doesn't, it's the worst piece of doo-doo um, in terms of uh, record production. How do they do that record? Amazing playing. I'm going with amazing singing, and I've showed this record many times. Her scatting, uh, one of the greatest uh, female vocals of all time, Ella Fitzgerald, the scatting on this, on How High the Moon and Mac the Knife it, that ends this album, is brilliant. It's live. It's it's immediate. It's improvisational. It is amazing. You need this album, Ella, in Berlin. I don't get it record. I don't get it, so I don't have a record to show because I don't get it. So there you go with that one. Free Jazz Me. Literally, this says Free Jazz. Ornick Coleman. Free Jazz You. Free Jazz Me. Ornick Coleman. Classic album that doesn't get played much. Um, one of the biggest albums of 1968 into 69 was this album, Blood, Sweat, and Tears. And this is an incredible record, and it was so overplayed. Um, this kind of got me into jazz, too, before I got into jazz. It's a very jazzy record and very well-produced record. Um, a lot of horns, a lot of arrangements, Eric Satie pieces, uh, so neoclassical pieces, modern classical pieces, but didn't get played much around here. Uh, I think about three years ago, I had it on a tape or on a car mix, and I loved it again. So it doesn't get played much, but it's a really good record. Why did this band only made one good album? They really made just one album, the Thunderclap Newman, produced by um, Pete Townsend, who was real heavily involved with it. Although their one signature song that got played so much as something in the air. It's at the end of Magic Christian. It's in movies. It's kind of this anthemic protest song, something in the air. Uh, but it's, uh, it is a great record. I produced it again on Track Records, which was the Who's label uh, with um, the producers of the Who. Uh, so what a great record. But one off, and that's it. Bye. Out of here. Speedy Keen. Um, okay, Tragedy, a tragic story album. Um, well, the tragic story is, and this story... It's tragic for many people, many artists, musicians who died in plane crashes, Buddy Holly and Steve Ray Vaughan and so on. But I'm going to go in here with um, the great Patsy Cline. I mean, she had it all amazing. She left us a lot of great work. This is the third man, amazing package of uh, kind of her hits and pretty much all you would need if you can find this record. But tragi tragedy, definitely, but Owen Bradley's recording of um, Patsy Cline is sublime. I'm sorry, album. Your partner loves it. You do not. Actually, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going the opposite way. I love Yoko Ono's Fly. Um, and most people I know don't. A handful of people love it. A handful of people don't. Um, maybe I will marry the woman who really loves this record. I don't know. I actually I'm just saying that don't even don't even go there people got this record wrong the critics didn't like it the fans didn't like it and I think it's one of the best Paul McCartney's record ever and this is the first Wings album Wildlife this is a fantastic record and I will I'm argue that this is better than Band on the Run this is better than Venus and Mars this is one of the few McCartney records in the 70s that doesn't sound dated today Mamunia Really? The go-to of all go-to albums. This is a go-to record for me, and this is the second album by Traffic. I mean, this is the last album uh, Dave Mason was on, but you got this great vocalist and keyboard and guitar player in Stevie Winwood. What a great sound. You got Jim Capaldi, great percussionist, and also vocalist, soulful. Dave Mason opens up both side one and side two with songs from him that sound amazing. You got the haunting flautist and Chris Wood feeling all right became this anthem and not anthem but a rock and roll staple that Lenny and Bonnie and so many uh, other artists trying to be heard Vagabond Virgin Pearly Queen feeling all right uh, I said that already <laughs> means to an end crying to be heard haunting what a great record their second record self-titled record 
traffic. They ripped off another band, Klaatu, as in Klaatu Verada Nikto, from the day the earth stood still, Gort, Klaatu Verada Nikto, uh, the Beatles. Now, of course, was that intentional? Capitol Records jumped on it, and uh, since they were anonymous, they said, is this the Beatles? I even have the press kit. This is a promo copy. And talking about that. So the, Be the Beatles label, basically in 1976 or 7, whatever this came out, uh, we're not telling you. Of course it wasn't the Beatles. I knew that, but I got a promo anyway. So there you go. Okay, a memory record bringing back old emotions. So look, basically every record in this room Every record has a story, or almost every record has a story, so I'm not going to do it. It wouldn't be fair for me to call out one record for that. There are specific records. I've uh, showcased them in my memories video, so I don't need to do that today. Condition is crap. Who cares? I don't want really bad, shitty records, so I usually get rid of them, the few that are here. Anyway, move on to that one. Disco Delight. Now... I'm just throwing this one out just because I was thinking about this the other day. I heard Tragedy. Um, where did I hear it? I heard it somewhere. I hadn't heard it in years. The way this explodes out of this first uh, track. This is I can, is this their first album or second album after Saturday Night Fever? But I remember this, and I saw them on this tour in 79 at the Open Coliseum. The disco tour, the most Saturday Night Fever tour. And fantastic record. I mean, there's so many discos. I mean, that's white disco, but the Bee Gees really helped perpetuate that to the masses as well okay the heaviest and hardest i'm not a big hard or heavy metal fan but 1968 this blew me away and this is vincimus eruptum vincimus eruptum blue cheer their debut psychedelic amazing just power trio to the hilt with summertime blues out of focus my band uh, my junior high school band and high school band uh, covered that song uh i blush I blush when I see this album, Erotic City, baby. This is Prince. Ooh. I love this record. This is Prince. That's Prince. By the way, I'm blushing so much, I even kept the long box for whatever reason. Okay, iconic and influential record. I mean, it's on my mind just because of uh, the loss this week of Tom Verlaine over the past week. So I think these two amazing debut, the debut and the follow-up, uh, my promo copies, which is nice. I worked in stores when these came out. Of course, Marquee Moon and uh, Adventure, uh, just great records. I mean, Tom Verlaine, Richard Lloyd, Fred Smith, and Billy Fica, 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 just um, amazing and very influential to a lot of groups including sonic youth and so many of these kind of indie guitar based bands uh, that came out uh, into the you know the 80s and the 90s and so on and now an iconic and influential record and of course that has to be Jimi hendrix are you experienced the debut album by Jimi hendrix whether you go american original american <laughs> tugboat label or you go stereo uh UK. Great record. Great record. Okay, a Get Smart album. Basically, an artist who does something else. Well, I'm going to go with Richard Hell and the Voidoids, the debut album. Uh, Richard Hell wrote a series of uh, some great uh, books. So he's a writer. Of course, anyone who writes music is a writer, technically, but he's a published author and he's written some pretty cool books. So Richard Hell, smart guy, smart punk guy, workmanlike album. And this I mean, just great, solid, like, work in it. And I'm showing a box set because any record this guy uh, has uh, did is amazing and workmanlike. And that's Little Richard, of course. Just great rock and roll, no frills, no conceptual bullshit crap, no psychedelic meandering. Uh, you got greatest hits. You know, anything Richard does is just incredible. I mean, I could have used any of these rock and rollers around this time. Jerry Lee Lewis, rock and roll at its primal, soulful, just gut-wrenching thing is workmanlike and not to take away anything. We've gotten too much into that whole, you know, these friggin' Sergeant Pepper and King Crimson and Yes and, you know, all that overdubbing stuff. This is two-track blast from the past the next one is the best lyrics someone who's clever 
Bob Dylan. He's done it for so long. He's still doing it. But the opening track and the closing track especially. Of course, every track on this record, Highway 61, Dylan Goes Electric. But the lyrics to Like a Rolling Stone are just sublime. And of course, closing with an ongoing amazing track of Desolation Row. I mean, he shows his smartness, but he shows how clever he is. It's great writing. It's poetic. It's wonderful. Harmonies. Whenever I think of harmonies, I think of brotherly harmonies. And to me, there's probably no one better than the Everly Brothers, uh, Tempestuous Brothers, but the Everly Brothers. An album that tries too hard. You know, the album he did, uh, the Sailor album, where it had country and soulful funk was brilliant and about his son. And they kind of tried too hard here. Sturgill Simpson, I think. Uh, this album is called Sound and Fury. He tried to mix, what is it, rock and roll and prog and country. And I still enjoy it, but it's a bit of a mess, really. Really, isn't it? He tr I think he tried too hard in this album. And of course, after all this and said and done, he kind of broke away from his record company and went back and did a bunch of bluegrass records. So he went... Uh, Back to the Roots. Works for me. Stand out. Album not so great. One killer performance or one killer track. Another Bob Dylan album. This is Down in the Groove. And the song Silvio. Very catchy. Just rotating kind of Silvio. Just keeps going on and on and on. Love the song. Silvio, Bob Dylan. Brave New Waves, a courageous album. After you do Rumors, what do you? how do you follow that up with this long meandering album in Tusk. And I love this record. To me, this is brilliant. I know it didn't do anywhere near what they expected after uh, Rumors, but Lindsey Buckingham took the bull by the horns. And, uh, you know, there's some weird-ass shit on this record that doesn't seem so weird-ass anymore. But Tusk, Fleetwood Mac. Sold Your Soul to the Devil, Sell Out. I don't even have the Sell Out album. And I quite like this record. Uh, this is... Tonight's a Night, Night in the Town, right? That's on this record. Um, <laughs> look at him. He already looks like a cell out there. No. Rod Stewart, what a great vocal. But by the time after this, a little after this, do you think I'm sexy and that whole thing? Sell out, sell out, sell out. People love it. Made a shitload of money. All the power to him. But I look at that. I got off the boat here. But I actually like this record. It's, it's kind of a good pop record for, uh, for the 70s. Now, this question I'm changing up a little bit because I'm going to support the artist more than the record company. This is, uh, you finished your contract and you mailed it in, you know, just to get things out, to get out of your contract. I'm going with the label. Dylan leaves Columbia, goes to Asylum Records. So Columbia grabs together some hodgepodge things and puts his album out, Dylan. Now, I happen to enjoy this record. It's a fun record, but the critics hated it. This is a, like somewhat of a contractual thing, I think, where they had the tapes. They had Anyway, they had rights to do it. And it has cover songs like Mr. Bojangles, Big Yellow Taxi, Fool Such As I, the Elvis thing, uh, Can't Help Falling In Love, which actually I like. I like this record. But I also, from the very beginning, love self-portrait. So Columbia, you know, kind of fucked him over a little bit with this when he went to Asylum. But for two records, Planet Waves, the live album that he's back at Columbia. So... Whatever that was about, I don't know the whole history. Now, uh, this is a more uh, touching thing. This is basically an album that was done and released while, recorded while an artist was dying and maybe released just after he died. I thought of uh, Warren Zevon on The Wind, but I decided instead to go with two records by Leonard Cohen. I mean, this, You Want a Darker, is to me a perfect album, and it's a beautiful, touching Wonderful album. Of course, earlier I showed uh, Black Star by David Bowie. That's in the same same frame of mind type record and posthumous. Uh, came out literally the weekend uh, he died or just before. And then there was a couple years later, his son Adam put this together, some unreleased uh, things they put together and they finished off. And both these albums are a wonderful, amazing pairing. So Leonard Cohen, the final two albums, just love this. You want it darker? Come on, Le Leonard. We love you. Watch the documentary Hallelujah. Won't disappoint. And lastly, the last record you would sell in your collection is The Beatles' Yesterday and Today, The Butcher Cover. Now, not only because it is this rare butcher cover. I actually have two butcher covers. It's sort of dog-eared. But, you know, when you get a butcher cover. But this was my 500th album. It was given to me on my birthday in 1973, so my 19th birthday, by my girlfriend, Judy. I didn't have one. 
1973. I didn't have a butcher cover, and she researched it before eBay, before, you know, she went around and found this album, and, and she wrote on it. It's a beautiful, schmaltzy little thing, but it's so touching to me, and it's dear to my heart that my girlfriend, when I was 17, excuse me, when I was 19, she was 20 year older than me, Mazzy, go Mazzy, um, found this record and gave it to me. I, I cried, I cried. It was such, just the, the time she put in finding this record, she knew I loved the Beatles, she knew I was a record collector, and she knew I was approaching 500th album in, when I was 19 years old. So thank you, Judy, wherever you are. Link below to Dan's Dots and Loop channel. You got me going for 101 records. I don't know how I did it. I'm exhausted. I need a cocktail now. Uh, Dan is really into psychedelic music, so he's up, uh, up north. You know, and uh, thank you again, and thank you for watching. Mazzy loves you all, and hope you enjoyed this. Hope you, if you, if you, if you uh, stayed to watch, then uh, uh, all the power to you. See you later.